I remember my brother bought me a book uh, called the, the Mammoth Book of the World's Greatest Chess Games. And um, it was a wonderful book. On every page there'd be a fantastic chess game and a description about it. And um, more games than any were played by Mikhail Tal. Now, the wonderful thing about Tal, in my opinion, the most beautiful thing about this man's style was that it was inaccurate and it was wrong a lot of the time but it was always fantastically creative now um, for those of you that don't know much about chess I mean obviously the idea is to kill your opponent's king to checkmate them um, but the normal way that this is achieved is by slowly grinding down the opponents and winning material. Um, so, for example, a chess knight has a certain value. If you can force your opponent's chess knight off the board, um, they have less pieces, so their game continuing from there on should be weaker, and so on and so forth. Um, now there's a beautiful idea in chess called the idea of a sacrifice. And the idea of a sacrifice is that you give away some material. You throw something away, you, you lose a knight on purpose, or you lose you lose something important on purpose. Um, but you do that in order to gain certain other things. It's transmutation. You give away some material, you gain some attacking chances or some positional or something like that and um, this is a very courageous thing to do in chess often because when you do a sacrifice you're giving away a kind of stable resource for something ethereal for something which you're not sure if you can capitalize on um, it's, a, it's a little bit like um, you know taking out you know buying a load of shares in some very unstable company or something you're not always sure it's going to pay off. Anyway, um, before Tal came around, there was a style of chess which was very, very sort of um, solid, very positional, quite quiet really. Most of the grandmasters around the time um, were, they played very, very conservatively. They didn't do that many uh, speculative sacrifices, and basically, their idea was to kind of play chess like a boa constrictor. You know, you just you don't risk anything. You don't move particularly quickly. You just slowly kind of uh, crush your opponents. Um, but this guy came along, and his style was completely different. I mean. The guy just was crazy. The, some of the sacrifices he did were just absolutely insane. They they continue to sort of bewilder people to this day, even with our chess computers and all of the theory that have, that has come after this guy. A lot of his games are still completely kind of um, kind of incomprehensible. And I mean. Um, one of his favorite, one of my favorite quotes by him. Um, I, I'm not sure if I can remember it exactly, but it goes something along the lines of: um, "There are two kinds of chess sacrifices, correct ones and mine." And if you look at some of this guy's games, you'll you'll see exactly what I mean. Um, the guy had um, <laughs> he had an addiction, I think doing stuff like this. He had an addiction to just um, making the game as complicated as possible. And, you know, if there was ever a point where he could have made a kind of sane move that would have given him a small advantage, or a kind of crazy sacrifice that would lead to some completely otherworldly game, he would almost always choose the latter. And this is why he his he has so many games in the uh, in the 
in this uh, book of the best chess games ever. Was he the best chess player ever? Technically, I don't think he was. I mean, he was grandmaster for a while, but, I mean, there were a lot of mistakes in his games. Um, if he was playing against some kind of alien intelligence or something that was perfect at chess, I mean, I'm sure he would lose a lot. He made a lot more mistakes than most people, but the point is that didn't matter, because he he forced the opponent into such an insane kind of um, world, like some kind of other planet or something, because the kind of moves he did were so strange and unexpected that um, he just took the player into his own world, and that world didn't make any sense. Uh, that's why the guy won. Um, so basically, I respect this guy's bravery, I respect his creativity, and I respect the fact that he was so happy to do these things, which I'm sure he knew half the time didn't make logical sense, but the point is that people are human. If you, if you force somebody into a, um, into a crazy position where they don't feel comfortable, maybe technically they're winning, but people are human and you know they're going to make mistakes anyway um what about his personality okay so i've got a quote here uh, this is from his first wife um how was so inequipped for living when he traveled to a tournament he couldn't pack his own suitcase he didn't know how to turn on a gas cooker if I had a headache and there happened to be no one at home but him, he would fall into a panic. How do I make a, a hot water bottle? And when I got behind the wheel of a car, he would look at me as though I was a visitor from another planet. Of course, if I had made some effort, if he had made some effort, he could have learned about all of this. But it was also boring to him. He just didn't need to. A lot of people said that if Tal had only looked after his health, um, if he hadn't have had such a dissolution life and so forth, but people like Tal, the idea of if only is just absurd. He wouldn't have been Tal then. So there's something else about Tal's personality which, well, I'm not sure I should say I admire it, but. I think I kind of do admire it. The guy was a inveterate smoker and a chronic alcoholic and didn't really care about his health at all. I mean, for him, every day, I think, was just about having as much fun as he could on that day. Now, you probably wouldn't expect this of a chess player if you, if you um, don't follow chess very much. You probably think of most chess players as guys with, you know, really thick glasses who um, who kind of, you know, always never never have a drink, um, you know, always sort of writing everything down and being very organised. This guy wasn't like that at all. I mean, he was completely reckless with his life. And I'm not saying I respect his recklessness per se, but... I respect the fact that um, I respect the fact that this guy was clearly always living in the moment so much. You know, you can tell by the way that he played chess, and well, I mean, you can tell by the way that he played chess because he often just made completely stupid moves from a technical point of view. But for him, it was all about the beauty. Okay, so if we have a look at this now we see that basically um, I'd say things are just on the at a very superficial level things are looking a bit grim for Tal the white pieces are very well developed you can see that a lot of the board has been controlled by them they're moving forwards uh, his pieces aren't so well developed and um, he looks like he's in quite a lot of danger here he's in danger of getting kind of crushed um, 
just sort of slowly. So what does it do? Well, a little bit like a kind of uh, animal that's been cornered against the wall, he has to do something a little bit, a little bit crazy to, to try and get out of it. So he decides to sacrifice a pawn. He pushes on d5, and this pawn is basically going to get lost. This is what happens. So now Tal's losing by a pawn. Now in many games, this would basically mean you're going to lose the game. If people are playing accurately, uh, and you're a pawn down, in, in, most, in most situations, that means you're going to lose. Um, but it's not so here, really, because Tal has got some compensation for this pawn that he's just lost. What, what compensation has he got? Well, basically, he's got more space for his pieces to move in, and more ways that he can attack. So, how does the game continue? <laughs> this is how he continues. So Tal just sacrificed a pawn. Now what is he doing? He's sacrificing a knight. Um, why? It doesn't really seem immediately obvious. I mean, um, he's just giving away a piece. So, I mean, this is Tal. He, he, he just loves to do things like this. Um... He just loves to do these crazy moves, which make the game completely um, make go somewhere else. So here he goes. So he loses his knight. And now what's he do? Well, now we see a kind of point behind this knight sacrifice. Is that he wants to attack this bishop. And of course this bishop can't move because the king's behind it. Um... Okay, so maybe that knight sacrifice was justified. <laughs> well, actually no, because the bishop can be defended by the king. So, actually it looks like Tal's just lost a knight. So Tal's just lost a pawn, and he's lost a knight. Um, so what do you do next? He does another sacrifice. Now he um, basically swaps a rook. He sort of offers to swap a rook for a bishop. Now, a rook is better than a bishop. So, again, Tal is sacrificing material. Now, um, his opponent, being a decent player, doesn't actually accept this. Because this is not a crazy sacrifice. If um, the king does take the rook, then bad things are going to happen to the king. Um complicated bad things that I'm sure Tal had calculated out, or at least had some idea of. Things like, um, if you take the king, then um, we can have knight goes here with a check, and then the queen can take the knight. And basically, um, a lot of bad things can happen. So, his opponent doesn't accept this next sacrifice. Moves the rook instead. <laughs> and so Tal does this move anyway. Again, a sort of reckless looking sacrifice. I mean, he, ju he just moves this knight right into harm's way. Um, it looks like the knight's going to get taken off. It looks like the rook's going to be in danger. Um... If you show this to most um, people, they'll just say, you know, Black's completely lost here. He's just throwing away all his material for no reason. So, the knight is lost, and the rook is hanging. Okay, so now we see the point. This bishop move. So after all of this material that Tal's given away, um, we see that, basically, he still has this really quite strong idea. Um, and that's basically that the king is in great danger. You see, 
Obviously, it doesn't matter how many pieces you give away, as long as you end up checkmating the king. And this bishop is enormously dangerous to the king, because um, the rook can move. When the rook moves, the bishop checks the king. And so we get this, what's called the discovered check. And that basically means that the rook can move around, snatching off pieces, whilst checking the king. And the king doesn't have many places to go. So his opponent wisely snatches off the bishop. And the queen comes back. Now, um, things are looking very dangerous for white here. I must say, it. you can see now what Pal's been doing all along. He's basically been burning away his material in order to gain a good attack on the king. But the game isn't really won yet, because White still has some fairly decent chances. I mean, this is very dangerous. White can take this pawn here, and he's threatening to make another queen. Anyway, so White moves his queen here. And now we get another brilliant move by Tal, which is a sacrifice. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, now he's just giving away a rook. So his opponent takes the rook. And what's going on here? Well, there's a combination. The bishop comes, forces the king back. In comes the rook. And um, you see White's trying to defend. But this really forces the game to be over. Because, um, I mean, White really has to take this rook with their knights. But then they're going to lose their queen. And um, with a bishop and a queen coming down and a white king, it's not going to be long until they get checkmate. This is where the opponent resigns. Um, so this is just one example. I mean, I think there are better tile games. This is just one I kind of picked randomly. But it's a perfect illustration of his style. I and mean, if we just go through the game again quickly, just look how many pieces that the black just gives away recklessly. And then in the end, he wins. And I, I, I'm not sure if this game is accurate. Some of Tal game, some of Tal's games are, you know, you can check them with computers and they seem completely accurate. But the majority of them, um, many of his sacrifices are highly speculative. Um, but they end up creating these fantastic games where things are just so sort of unbalanced and weird that there seems to be this kind of magical effect that seems to happen. I mean, people say fortune favours the bold. Well. You know, I think maybe that's true, especially in chess. Okay then, so now after that masterpiece, um, I'd like to show you a game which I've recently played. Now, I'm no grandmaster. I'm, I guess, a fairly decent chess player by, by some measure, but certainly not on the, um, certainly not on a kind of, Okay, so now I'd like to show you one of my chess games. Now I'm not, I'm no grandmaster, and I'm sure that the um, the sort of chess professionals who are watching this, if there are any, will spot many mistakes in this game. Um, but I want to show you it nevertheless because um, because I want you to see that I've tried to sort of emulate half style a little bit. So I'm playing with white here, and this is a normal kind of Sicilian opening. Okay, so nothing too crazy happening yet. Um, 
my opponent isn't that strong, so, um, you know, that probably explains why black's quite badly developed here. So I'd say I do have an advantage at this point. Um, and nothing too insane has really happened yet. Okay, so Black's really getting pushed around now. Um, so now there's sort of become these opportunities for me to attack. And um, a good way to attack, as um, Tal's games have, have helped me understand, is to do some sacrifices. But first, of course, one has to get the pieces into the right places. Okay then, so here we are, um, I've got a fairly decent, um, you know, I've got all my pieces developed, uh, Black doesn't have many of their pieces developed, Queen is miles away, um, not really um, ready to protect their own pieces, so time to capitalise, how to capitalise on this, well, I'm not sure if it was the right thing to do, but I certainly enjoy doing it. I sacrificed a rook. Okay, so I've just lost a rook. What have I gained? Well, the king is now more exposed. And I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to checkmate them. So the bishop comes in. The king has to move. And then there is this possibility of um, just taking a rook with a bishop and, um, you know, um, getting some material back. Um, but that wasn't really what I wanted to do. I decided to sacrifice the rook again. So now I've lost two rooks. I mean, basically, losing two rooks is about the same as losing a queen. Um, it's a really massive amount of material to lose. So now I absolutely have to... Um, I have to... make something of this. Basically, checkmate the king. Otherwise, I'm completely dead. Because if black's able to recover, then, um, you know, they're they're going to win. So, here comes the game. Here comes the, the moves. And so, with this queen coming in here, there is a chance to get this rook back. So now I've got one rook back. And the king's getting chased all over the board. Okay then, so one more sacrifice, just for good luck. Um, here comes the knight, I'm giving away a knight. Why? Well, because this is checkmate. And so, and this is a game I've played quite recently. Now, um, you know, I'm not claiming that this is accurate, and I, I really hope that some, um, you know, some really high rated chess player doesn't come on here and start telling me that um, loads of the moves are wrong because I know a lot of them are probably wrong. To be quite honest, if we go back to this position back here, I'm pretty sure that there was a lot safer things I could have done than take off this pawn with this rook. And certainly I didn't calculate any of, I didn't calculate all of these positions and things. Um, I just kind of had a feeling that maybe there would be a, um, an attack going on here if I could do this. I don't know if Tal thought the same way. 
I don't know if he could calculate out um, all of these positions which he played. Um, and I think he probably couldn't, because he played a lot of inaccurate moves, to be quite honest. Um, I think he was probably quite similar in the regard that he could just have a kind of intuition about whether a particular sacrifice was either, um, you know, whether it would work or whether it would at least throw his opponent into such a strange and peculiar world um, that they wouldn't be able to recover. So um, I'd like to finish with one more quote by Tal, uh, as well as I can remember it. I think he said something like, you must force your opponent into a deep, dark forest where 2 plus 2 equals 5, and the path out is only wide enough for one. 